every field of science, there are some persistent myths that spread in popular culture. Unfortunately, material science is no different, and it's time that someone set the record straight. These are the top five myths about materials. Number five, radioactive elements glow green. This one has become a staple of pop culture. Often when you see something like uranium or plutonium depicted on TV, it has a distinct green glow around it. But the boring truth about radioactive elements is that they're just metals, and like most other metals, they're generally a silvery gray color at room temperature. This is a picture of enriched uranium. This is plutonium. There's not much to see here. But while radioactive elements don't actually glow, there are a few good reasons why the color green came to be associated with them. Probably the biggest one is radioluminescent materials. These use a radioactive element like radium or tritium, and they do commonly actually have the characteristic radioactive green glow. But the light isn't actually coming from the radioactive material. The electron emission given off by the radioactive element excites a phosphor coating, and the phosphorescence from the coating is what you're actually seeing. It's also worth mentioning that uranium ore, which is mostly uranium oxide, can be a pale yellowish-green color, and uranium glass will glow green under UV lighting, but neither of these are actually related to the radioactivity. Number 4. Spider silk is stronger than steel. So, this one is subject to interpretation. What kind of steel? What kind of strength? Maybe even what kind of spider? If we assume we're talking about ultimate tensile strength, it is true that spider silk can be stronger than some commonly used kinds of steel. But to me, that's not enough to call it stronger than steel in general. You can't claim to be faster than Usain Bolt if you're only talking about his speed during a morning walk to the coffee shop. So, is the strongest spider silk stronger than the strongest steels? To put it simply, no. And it's not particularly close. Commercially available steels have now reached up to 3.5 gigapascals. The highest value I could find for spider silk isn't even half of that. The truth is that it's a bit of a pointless comparison, though, because strength isn't the sole purpose of either material. There are plenty of materials stronger than spider silk or steel. Steel is so common because it's a multifunctional material. In other words, it's not that it has one really good property, but rather because it does a lot of things pretty well. Spider silk, on the other hand, does have one truly incredible property, but it's not strength, it's toughness. While strength is the maximum amount of force a material can withstand per unit area, toughness is related to the maximum amount of energy a material can absorb. Highly elastic materials are generally much tougher since they can stretch so much before failure, and this makes spider silk perfectly suited to absorbing the energy of incoming snacks. While we're on the subject of steel, Number 3. Stainless steel is non-magnetic. This one isn't a myth as much as a misunderstanding. Some of the most common stainless steel grades are non-magnetic, but being stainless and being non-magnetic are actually two different properties, and some types of stainless steels are highly magnetic. The magnetic properties of any iron-based alloy are related to its crystal structure. The three common phases of steels are ferrite, austenite, and martensite. Pure iron and most types of non-stainless steel are ferritic steels, and therefore magnetic. Stainless steels are commonly austenitic due to a high nickel content stabilizing the FCC phase, making them non-magnetic. But there are several types of stainless steels that are ferritic or martensitic. It's also worth noting that even for austenitic stainless steel, the FCC phase isn't completely stable at room temperature. You might have noticed that a severely bent or mangled piece of normally non-magnetic stainless steel 
can actually become weakly magnetic. So stainless steels can be magnetic, and actually the inverse of this myth isn't true either. Not all non-magnetic steels are stainless. There are other alloying elements that tend to stabilize the austenitic phase, manganese for example. Hadfield steel, also known as mangaloy, is a pretty common non-stainless steel that's also non-magnetic. Number 2. Plastic water bottles release dioxins when frozen. While other myths might have had some elements of truth, or at least reasons why they became popular, this one is pretty much wrong on every front. This started as a chain email in the early 2000s, and it's about as scientifically accurate as a chain email from the early 2000s. Dioxins are formed at high temperatures, and can be a major environmental hazard due to bioaccumulation, but they're not part of the PET synthesis or forming processes. This myth is wrong on two levels, though, because even if water bottles did contain dioxins, freezing wouldn't release them. This sort of chemical leaching is generally governed by diffusion, and diffusion is much slower at low temperatures. So, if you ever find yourself in an alternate reality where your drinking containers do contain dioxins, freezing might be your best option. Number 1. Glass is a supercooled liquid. This is really the king of material science myths. It's something that sounds really deep and interesting, and it gets repeated even by people who are pretty scientifically literate. Let's start out with the basis for this myth. Glass, the stuff you see in windows, has an amorphous structure. Unlike crystalline materials like metals or ceramics, there's no long-range order of atoms. In other words, no crystallinity. Liquids obviously don't have any crystalline structure either, so on a structural level, glass is kinda like a liquid where atoms just got frozen in place. Some have also used this as an explanation for why some medieval windows are thicker at the bottom. Maybe the glass has been flowing really slowly for hundreds of years. But here's the thing. Glass is solid at room temperature. Very solid. That thickness at the bottom of really old windows is just a byproduct of their construction techniques, and theoretical analysis has showed that the flow rate of glass is about one nanometer per billion years. Now before anyone says, well, if it flows at all, it's liquid, consider this. Crystalline solids flow at temperatures well below their melting points too. Creep is a well-known phenomenon that describes this deformation process. Like glass, usually at room temperature the rate of deformation is so slow that it's not observable, but it's still technically there. In fact, the creep rate for many metals at room temperature is many orders of magnitude above that flow rate of glass. Glass is not only a solid, it's a particularly solid solid. 